Okay, good evening and uh, Happy New Year, uh, belatedly to everybody out there. Uh, welcome to this uh, Northern Writers Awards Poetry Roadshow, brought to you by New Writing North. I think if you've joined us for any of our previous roadshows that we've been doing, um, you'll understand that, that these are a series of virtual events that we've been doing, which are focused kind of around our Northern Writers Awards, but touching into a, the kind of broader world of writing as well, in connection with, with, with the awards. So the roadshow today is focused on poetry. Um, my name is Will Mackey, I work at New Writing North, and I'm really pleased to have a panelist specialist with me who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, the Northern Writers Awards, I just wanted to give you a bit of background into them. The, this is a writer development programme for writers in the north of England. It runs every single year. This year's awards are open at the moment and they're open until the 18th of February. The awards are free to enter um, and we'd, you know, we'd, we'd really encourage writers to, to have a look at them at um, w.northernwritersawards.com uh, to see the portfolio of, of awards that are on offer to you. I just wanted to thank our core supporters, uh, Arts Council England, who's, who support New Writing North, and also Northumbria University, who specifically support the Northern Writers Awards. There is also a range of uh, other partners who support the awards. Uh, we've got many different categories, many different types of award, and we're really grateful to all the partners that we work with on the awards. Um, and if you go to the website, you can see a list of all of them there. To focus on, on poetry, just, you know, for today, um, this year's Poetry Awards are going to be judged by the poet Andrew McMillan. We have two main categories of Poetry Award. The first is the Northern Debut Award for Poetry. This is for poets who are yet to publish a full-length collection. You can enter these awards, um, this particular strand of the awards, if you have, for example, published a pamphlet or two pamphlets. Uh, but if you have not yet kind of published a full collection, uh, you're, you, you're eligible, essentially. Okay. There's also um, worth looking at that particular award if you're looking for a kind of package of award support. So the Northern Debuters Awards will offer the winners a bursary, but they'll also offer mentoring support and access to other elements of the, uh, of the range of things that we offer here. There's also the flagship Northern Writers Awards for Poetry Awards that are there as well. And these are bursary awards, so you can apply to these to win up to uh, 5,000 pounds of, of uh, prize money. So those are the awards there and please you know ask any questions uh, about them that, that you want to today and we'll try to answer those. I was going to mention also that my colleagues uh, are out there as well today. Um, my colleague Grace is within the Zoom thing so she's out there to answer questions um, that you may post into the chat or to, or to kind of refer those chats to me and the panel. And my colleague Laura is also out there on social media, so if you're doing Twitter, uh, please try and find Laura out there in, in, in the, the social media world while, you know, while we're on. So I was really grateful to everybody who signed up for this event today um, and for all the questions that we sent, and I thought that you know, we had some really, really good questions, interesting stuff that you're ask, asking us. And we're going to kind of endeavour to answer those questions to today as we go through this. A lot of people are asking pretty similar things. So I've tried to group uh, the um, session into, into certain different sections to allow us to cover those things. If you, if you find that your question isn't getting answered or you have another question that occurs to you within the next hour or so, then please post it into the chat and we'll, we'll try and get onto it. Um, so thank you very much for, for all of those. I also think we want to use the session to kind of give a sense of what the poetry world is like out there at the moment for poets at different levels of uh, different stages of their career. So whether you're a really very new poet or someone who's had a bit of experience, maybe publish a collection as well, then please stick around because we really want to, to try to gain some, some insight into that. And the poetry world is, as I think anyone who's involved with it knows, pretty challenging and operates in quite a distinctive way um, you know, it's quite different from other areas of publishing and the way it operates. And so with that, I'm going to in, uh, sort of ask the people that are going to help us to answer these questions to introduce themselves. So I'm really pleased to be joined by JT Welsh, um, a poet and academic, Romy Smith, uh, a poet and also an academic um, and previous Northern Rights Awards winner, 
Hannah Bannister, who is um, who works at the the leading independent poetry publisher People Two Press, who have an, an incredible list, and Joe Clement, a poet and publisher who uh, runs the um, Butcher's Dog magazine, which is uh, a, 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 just a, a brilliant showcase for for um, for poets uh, in the region and beyond. So I'm going to ask each of you to to introduce yourselves sort of one by one, and I'm you know to do this randomly and ask Romy to go first. Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me to be part of tonight's panel. So I'm Romy Smith. I'm a poet, playwright, theatre maker and scholar. And I was privileged to win the new Writing North Award in 2019, selected by Don Patterson, whose work I've long admired. Um, I think that's all that I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, Romy. Um, and next to Hannah. Uh, nice to see, well, kind of see people. <laughs> um, I'm Hannah Bannister and I work at People Tree Press. Um, we are a publisher. We began in 1985 or 6, depending on where you draw the line. Um, we specialise in Caribbean and Black British writers. Um, we've published about books and about 40% of that's poetry. So, yeah, we definitely consider ourselves poetry specialists. Um, we've publish everything from um well pamphlets but we call them chat books i don't really know what the difference is um but collections without spines of works in development um full collection and big anthologies and we occasionally have calls for submissions through inscribe which is a writer development kind of arm of people tree um, last one of those was filigree and um, edited by nia quid parks um, We've had a really good 2020, bizarre, um, where Roger Robinson's Portable Paradise picked up the T.S. Eliot Prize and the Andarchi Prize. So it was kind of a greedy success year, but we're very grateful for it. Um, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And it's been brilliant to see those, those, those successes at People Tree, um, uh, particularly at Portable Paradise, which I just think is a, like just a wonderful collection and, uh, that, that everyone should get around to reading. Um, and I was going to ask JT next just to quickly introduce yourself. Hello, uh, yeah, as, as Will said, I, I am a poet and I've, I've published, I don't know, a bunch of different pamphlets and different length things, um, but I'm, I guess I'm mostly an, an academic who works on poetry, but especially on, on publishing. And so my research and my teaching and stuff is a lot around thinking about these questions that Will raises about how the poetry kind of uh, publishing works and how it's different from other areas or how it's like other areas in the creative industries. So I'm really fascinated by that that big picture. So I guess I'll do my best to bring that kind of perspective here. Yeah, and you've, you've really done a lot of research into this, haven't you? I think into the, the kind of the, the poetry industry, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Up. And then, Joe, I think um, you were having some some trouble uh, with sound. I, I'm really hopeful that maybe you're not anymore, but are you? You can hear what I'm saying now. Amazing. Woo! <laughs> Thank the Lord. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here and to be heard. Um, I'm Jo Clement, and I won a Northern Writers Award way back in 2012. I'm the author of two illustrated books of poetry, Movable Type and Outlandish, both of which were published by New Writing North. And as of 2019, I can officially call myself a doctor of creative writing. Um, I'm also the managing editor of Butcher's Dog Poetry Mag, as Will says. Um, and yeah, I'm a Northern writer. I was born in Darlington and I keep the press running from right here in my ground floor flat in North Shields. So yeah, that's me. Yeah, and you, you pretty much manage every element of the press, don't you? Yeah, I have a, a typeset who comes in and, and does the work for us, Sophie, in, in that respect. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very much spinning lots of plates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic. Thanks, Joe. And, and those, um, you know, poetry magazines, we're going to come back to, I think, a little bit, but, but they're so much a part of the ecology of, the, of, of, of poetry in this country and so important. It to as a way of actually you know people getting their work out there and, and um, showcasing their work 
So the first few questions we had were, were kind of about the Northern Rights Awards themselves. Um, and there were a couple actually that, that uh, I could answer just really quickly. One is from someone who's saying whether it's best to enter the Northern Debuts category or to, to enter the other category, the Northern Rights Awards category. And I would say essentially, if you're eligible for, for both of them, then have a look at them both and think about which one you are likely to benefit more from in terms of the type of support that's been offered. So kind of look at it from that direction. Um, one person asked if we're looking for more than just a manuscript proposal for our poetry awards. Not really, no, we're looking essentially for for a manuscript proposal, actually. Um, we're looking for you to show that you have a manuscript that you want to develop through, through the award. Uh, another question is um, just about the, the quantity of po uh, poems that we ask for. So we ask for a certain number of poems, uh, a certain num number of pages of poetry, um, so which I think is up to 30 pages. So essentially, if you're not writing single like poems that are single page long, you, you're, an equivalent amount is, is is just adding up to that thirty pages in total. So Joe, uh, Joe and Romy, um, so someone had asked what the award did for you in terms of of um, you know supporting you as a poet and in other parts of your life. And just briefly, I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe maybe Romy, do you want to go? Actually. Joe, Romy, you go first, sure. and then Joe, you chip in. Okay. Well, I think uh, it was the recognition of being awarded it, and it was who awarded it. It was um, being selected by Don Patterson. Um, that though both of those things were a great honour, and I think the other word that I would I comes to mind other than recognition is momentum, because it gave momentum for other things. So it was the award itself the ceremony and all those things attached to it, which were, were lovely to experience and the conversations that I had with Don afterwards about my work and the things that he said about my work um, off of the podium, which were deeply encouraging. And I also have gone on to do other things as a consequence. So I was awarded a Society of Authors grant, which is a prestigious grant for writers to be awarded for works in progress. I received that this year. I've also um, been selected as a Sphinx 30 playwright. Again, another thing that I went for, again, the momentum. Um, well, I was actually nominated for that one as a result of something I was commissioned to do. But it's this idea of sort of momentum building, profile building. And then the other big thing is that I decided to apply for a Carve Canem Fellowship. And Carve Canem is an extraordinary global movement of black poets. And, um, you know, there are poets that I adore who were part of that movement. And I applied in December last year and I was awarded a fellowship in April of this year. And I'll go to the States when I can, <laughs> which will be to experience the retreat that's attached. So that is what I mean about the kind of momentum and those ideas of the uh, the award being like a key and I think you notice it across the trajectory as you're building but the things become keys for other things you know people know that you've got that so then that can it means maybe they dare I say they kind of take you more seriously you know they maybe read you differently because of that thing they look at you differently so I think the key that it's, everything's a little portal to somewhere else. They're keys that lead to other portals. Yeah, oh, I, love, I love that idea of the key, absolutely. Um, and that's it's entirely, it's completely what we hope it to be actually, that it's something that, that um, recognizes your talent and helps you um, as you go on to other things. Th thanks for that, Romy. And Joe, yours was, yours was a little while ago, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, I was thinking about this last night and suddenly feeling very old. Um, mine was back in 2012 and it was Paul Farley who chose my, um, my, my poetry for that. And yeah, um, I agree with like so much of what Robbie, Romy has said um, in terms of the importance and the relevance of the, of the application. And I thought I'd say something, speak really to the process of applying because back then it was kind of a very different time for the awards in terms of how the applications were accepted and how they were processed. 
So it wasn't through submittable then as it is now or just through submittable. You could you could apply by snail mail. And because I didn't have a computer at the time, I sent mine in by post. And to do this, I remember sort of making selections of what I felt were my best poems from what were multiple handwritten journals that I'd been working in and working across really for years. And to do this, I actually... I typed up all the poems using a typewriter that I'd bought from a local charity shop for like the grand price of a fiver. Um, and it might not seem very relevant to people in the audience who are thinking of applying for an award or maybe you've already applied um, because obviously everything is digital now. But I do want folks to kind of remember that if you're here, then, you know, you're very fortunate that you've got some kind of smart device and you've got an internet connection, you know, you've got spell checking word and maybe you're using Grammarly to spot check, you know, your diction or your spelling. Um, but not everyone has this privilege and really back then I didn't. And, you know, digital poverty now is something that's a very real thing. So I'm delighted to hear that this is going to be sort of um, made available on YouTube so anyone can access it at any time from anywhere when it's convenient for them. Yeah. So it seems strange, but using a typewriter was the most kind of affordable and the most useful way for me to get my poems and my cover letter together, you know, just to, yeah. to get the components just right. And the most important thing to me was the quality of the work that I was sending. So everything else seemed peripheral. So yeah, thinking about it in terms of process and the application process itself actually helped my writing practice because I mean if you just think about it in terms of a poems on genre you know lines that are handwritten obviously look very different um lengths to lines that are in print especially like in my chicken scratch handwriting so um yeah editorially I was I was word processing without a computer yeah. Um, yeah, and so that gave me an opportunity to look at my work a bit more objectively or much more objectively because we're in very much a click it like you know like it click it get it tomorrow sort of culture um and being able to separate from the the digital then was actually a bit of an advantage um so i'd recommend people you know take their poems yeah away I, from a computer you know as far away from the computer as they can get and and edit them that way type them up until they're kind of they're ready and they're there i think that's really good advice actually and that that element of kind of how you make a selection in your work is obviously important for these awards, but it's important for, for anything you're doing as a poet, isn't it? Like choosing the work to send out yeah. and how you do it and selecting your work and um, getting that, that sense of, of what you're willing to share of your work at a particular time. Yeah. And I think that, that kind of brings us on to the next sort of theme, which is about how you build your portfolio as a poet. Um, so there was one question that someone sent in that I wanted to ask. Um, one of you to answer, which is how would you, so this is really early stage, but how would you recommend getting your very first poem published? I don't know, um, JT, do you have any thoughts on that? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I get, I get a lot of students asking that are people at kind of early stages and it, it, it just always feels to me like that, that, that it's a question that they know the answer to, that you have to just send things out, that, that it's sort of like you have to play, you have to kind of um, play that game and you have to hedge your bets. So send as many things out as possible and kind of play, play the odds. Um, but to do that smartly, I guess, by, by really engaging with the kind of um, journals and things that are out there and places to get published and to not, um, to not feel it as just a one-sided thing that you're kind of sending these things out in the dark, but to send to places that you're reading and that, you know, you, you know, they all tell you to do that, right? They all tell you to read an issue of their magazine before you send stuff, but to, but to do that genuinely and to take an interest in things that are out there, it will make you a better writer, but you can also then be strategic about where you send things. But I think it is just that, 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 that leap, that first time of sending stuff out. Um, and then maybe that, maybe that second kind of key moment of getting those first rejections um, and immediately sending them out again, and keeping your spreadsheet and just getting into a, a real habit with it that you can kind of build up your, your thick skin and, 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 and see it as a kind of game that you're just constantly like pressing that button again and just in, in sending it in whatever form. And 
it will come around. There will be there will be some point, but it will be the one you least predict. It'll be the poem that you you know you least think that you threw in at the last second, and it'll be some journal um, that you sort of thought you were taking a punt on and and and, and didn't know. Yeah. So does people think that, you know about it's about finding a bit of a spread of work maybe and the spread of places to send it to? I think that advice about reading the magazines that you're sending to is really really important, isn't it? I think I would also just want to really think about what the word publishing means. I think for two reasons. I mean, just to add on from what JT has said, I think you can look for anthologies, reputable anthologies that are um, soliciting poems to be sent in. That might be one great way. You might even be invited to submit poems for selection for an anthology. But I, as someone who came through um, a performance route, so I started to perform my work right poetry when I was 10 and performed my work professionally from the age of 14, I actually felt that publication avenues were not available to me. They did not reveal themselves to me. They were not coming my way. And there are plenty of reports that have been done that have shown the kind of lack of publishing opportunities for black writers. And maybe that's something that Hannah can also speak to. And Hannah, by the way, People Tree is also my publisher. But I think that I, I think that kind of performing your work as publication is also important. So open mics, those that in, in, um, exist in the digital realm in, in the pandemic moment is looking for opportunities to share work because if you want to know about honing your craft and honing your poem, you can get that immediately from an audience, how an audience is responding to things and that can help you with an editing process, the reaction. You also get to hear it off the page and in any writing process, you want to be reading stuff out loud to yourself to hear flow and cadence and rhythm and structure. And you know, if something sort of doesn't flow you'll know it when you read it out loud even if your intention is for that to be print publication so i think the um the relationship between performance and print publication is really important yeah and i suppose if you look at if you look at performance um you know as as a as another way of building your portfolio as another way of achieving credits is, is like you say as an equivalent to publication then that opens up a whole new world of opportunities as well, I think, doesn't it? Uh, like a whole load of a whole load of other options for you. Yeah, um, I think Hannah, were you, did you want to pick up on anything there? I just to massively agree with all that, but I think I think the key to it is engagement. That if you want to be a public, you need to really engage with the publishing. I mean, all the the tips from Romy are fantastic on, you know, reading it aloud to yourself, and doing what. I which is like challenge every word why is that there what is it doing does it have a point and you know polishing and you know when it does get rejected i would look at it again you might well find that there's nothing you want want to change and um, and that building a kind of a relationship i suppose with the kind of people you want to be alongside and um taking an interest in other poets and definitely the reading yeah yeah okay fantastic so with that sense of, you know, curating your, your poetry portfolio and, and gradually building it and trying to get work into different publications. And then I was going to ask Joe if you think the next step is naturally to look at, at pamphlets, um, you know, when you're beginning to get a, a body of work together as, as a, an opportunity, I suppose, that, that, that a pamph like go for public, public publication might offer you. Yeah, well, I mean, my debut pamphlet, Movable Type, which is beautifully typeset and published by New Writing North, um, that was due to launch last March, and pretty much in that was in the week of the first week of lockdown when that kicked in. So yeah, I was I was kind of gutted not to have a, a real life launch event, and there's so much momentum that that builds up with that. You know, you. You have like social media strategies in place and review copies and I mean the work that I published in that pamphlet was from my PhD it was sort of a selection of 25 poems from from my PhD research um, and I think the pamphlet really holds a, a very special place in your imagination especially the first one because we want to have 
our words in print and we want to hear them performed and we want them to be read you know by real readers and to be heard by an audience so yeah I think a pamphlet is a great starting point for any poet and it should bring together poems that share a kind of an invisible but a binding thread and that really takes time and attention together yeah and do, do you um to Hannah or JT do you think that there are, are more opportunities for pamphlets than than collections I mean I get that impression that there are just more outlets essentially but is that true um, I yeah I think it's a real golden age for the pamphlet and I know people kind of say this all the time it's like sort of this is the year of the pamphlet but there are there, there's this whole spectrum of all these different forms, everything from kind of DIY zines that people are making to different kinds of things that are emerging from alongside performance. Um, it maybe it's the kind of backlash against the, the digital stuff. I think that people are really interested in like the, the physical books again. I would say that because I run a press where we do letter press and stuff and I love movable type as a, uh, but, but I think, yeah, I think that finding that match that Joe's talking about between the content and the, in the physical form of the thing is something that a lot of presses are looking for and people are, are starting their own presses, you know, and that's something if you, if you find yourself in a, in a, in a group of poets, things to think about, but it's, um, there are pamphlet competitions. There are a few, you know, great ones around um, that are sort of, that have been running for a long time, but there are also just people st setting up these presses and they're these doing these cheaply made pamphlets and those can be a real calling card. Yeah. Yeah, I think they give you a good place to start, really. I mean, you, 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 if you, if you're at the point where you're getting a pamphlet together, then de facto you must, you must be discovering your voice, um, and it can give you confidence. You know, I think, I mean, we're not doing real life events now, but if you can march in there and think, no, this will represent me, then you, you're becoming a poet in your own mind, um, and you know, living the life of a poet, and that is gonna help you yeah it gives you um that valuable credit of having some a publication there doesn't it that that kind of yeah it, and, and again i think we said with prizes that they're, they're getting te being taken more seriously it's another another one of one of those keys that Romy had unlocking yeah through exactly. the portals yeah so, so uh, we had one very specific question actually which was from someone who is about to launch a pamphlet a debut pamphlet pamphlet in uh, June 2021 and the poet was asking if we had any advice about holding a successful launch um, and promoting the book and it's obviously a really difficult time you know but by, by June 2021 um, you know there's no obviously no guarantee that we're going to be able to do actual events then does it does anyone have any actual advice for this this poet? I would say this medium is probably going to be the way forward I think we've all sort of resolved ourselves for the next that maybe 2021 is going to look like this for the next year events are going to be held online um, and the pamphlet is you know it's often the place that you first encounter a poet and really get a taste for what their work is all about not in a sort of single poem sense um, but in the way the poems talk to each other in the way that the the poet talks to you um, as an audience so the pamphlet's really a great way to announce yourself to the publishing industry in terms of, you know, progressing to a collection, but most importantly, to present yourself to a reader. So that idea of audience, I don't think has ever been more important, really. Um, and the digital, I think, is, is the way forward with that. But also just, you know, the very medium of a pamphlet, the history of pamphleteering is deeply married to real world impact. That poetry can have on society because you know pamphlets were used as political weapons for instance in the French Revolution um, so this really you know it should remind us that the poetry pamphlet has this power to stir things up and to share new ways of thinking um, so yeah if you've got a, a pamphlet that's coming out I think you have to share it and you just have to find a new route around the sort of new way that we're, we're living at the moment and continue to disrupt the order of things and and you know draw attention to the things that you want to to draw attention to yeah yeah 
I think I'd also add to that that this is a time of um, taking stock and a time of reading and deepening knowledge and rooting and earthing. And I've definitely seen this winter as a kind of time of kind of almost incubation, sort of really um, having time, extended time because of an enforced stillness to sort of sit still with ideas and refine things and read lots and take lots of stuff in. So again, this, this is useful time but also to encourage um, people listening to seek out opportunities to share their work online. There are lots of pop-up events that are happening, lots of events that happen which um, have an open mic attached, even online. If they don't exist in the way you like them, you can set them up yourself. This is great. So, um, yeah, yeah. To see this as a time that's in which we can be resourceful with it. Yeah, and, and I'd say I'd say try and record everything so that you have it for the future. I mean, you may not decide to like stick it on you, but um, I think this is a time where we, yeah, we have to document what's going on now. And um, it'll, you know, edit it up, it'll be a promo that you've got that's just an, a handy link that when you're talking later to like bookshops and places that you want it to be physically stocked, um, you can chat all about really quite easily. You've got an opportunity to share something. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's really, really good advice. So I think that I was going to move on to talking a little bit about collections now, because a few people had um, as, as things they wanted to ask about about how you go about, you know, getting a collection out there. One thing that came up from a few people was um, if you need a specific coherent theme that runs through a collection. So I thought um, I might ask Hannah that first, just as a publisher, to see. What, what the publishers are looking for, if that sense of the theme is appealing, um, but then everybody else can, can come in as well. And Hannah? It's difficult. I would say often, yes, there is, there is some reason for these poems to be put together and, and printed on paper, spine and that title on there. So there is something that unifies it. It may not be something as simple as, you know, oh, these are all poems about mothers, but there will be so yeah we will we'll, we'll, at people tree we really are looking for a voice um, and one that's distinct from other voices we've seen and it is a strangely magical bit where that comes together and um, i'd say you submit your best poems and and that might you, you should have an idea what the shape of your collection and why yeah a reason for why you've put these together um, but also be prepared that a good editor will, will challenge you on that and expand it. And it's really common for a collection of poetry as it's published with its spine on and in the shops. It's not different to what it was, but it, it's, it's very much more itself. And that can come out in the relationship and the poets um, as they work out what it is that works what it you know what is it that i am trying to do is a big question for a poet putting a collection yeah okay. it's not really just gathering up your best ones although that is quite a lot of it <laughs> yeah um, oh, it's a bit oblique isn't it that's i think that's a, a really good to hear that from the publisher's point of view actually um and i was wondering you know from, from um point of view of the poet if you act actually go into it writing with the, the sense of a theme or if that's something that kind of emerges retrospectively almost once you've got more work together. Can I jump in on this one? Oh yeah. sorry Romney if you want to go you could go. <laughs> we can both go just uh, <laughs> why um, don't you can go. So I can only really think about collections in terms of my own reading but also my own practice and how those two things differ. So you know if there are any if a writer is anything like me, then they won't begin writing a collection. They'll start writing a poem. Um, and some of those poems will jar and some of them will sing together. Um, you know, one poem will lead to another and maybe you'll identify gaps. Um, often people just think thematically or perhaps in terms of narrative um, when they think of collections. But I like to think, you know, sonically in terms of how the poems are working, you know, what's the radio tune? tuning into now what's what's happening there and I suppose because I've you know I've wrote a collection I don't know Romy's you, is yours also a creative practice PhD Romy that you're 
you're doing at the moment. Yes, yeah, I'm finishing, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to forget, isn't it, that with any book, you know, there's a practice and a process that has taken place. So when it comes to making selections of work, you know, it helps to kind of lay everything down and to start to order things. And order is probably the most important thing, I think, to, to what a writer does best, you know, putting the best words in the best order. Um, and that we have to kind of step in and out of that role of, of reader and writer being so intimately connected to the text, but then also stepping back and being able to, to meet it in you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you hop in there now, yeah. if that's okay with me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe this responds to, I noticed in the chat, Lydia's question about uh, s submitting sequences or extracts of different sequences. But I, I think that it's useful to sort of lay down what, what are your strongest pieces of work? What do you have already written that are your strongest pieces of work? So these should be... Um, just saying this for everybody these will be pieces of work that you've workshopped that you've talked about with others that you've perhaps had editorial feedback on so sort of to create a separate file and put all those in will perhaps you can speak to this but I mean I would say that it's useful to think what is the thing that you most most want to write you know rather than sort of including disparate sequences focus on the one thing that matters most and push forward with that because that's the one idea that you're going to drive through in terms of if you receive the award and that was certainly what I decided to do it was very clear to me what it was that I wanted to work on I had been honing it for some time I then brought it under the auspices of my PhD and refined it through a research process that sharpened lots of things up in including forms that I was experimenting with and then I really felt at the time of application that I was putting forward the best work that I could do from this one sequence. And I had taken it through processes of informal feedback and then feedback from my editor, who's Jeremy Pointing at People Tree and other you know, friendship groups. I felt that I had taken it to the best place that I could take it. So what I was sending in was the best I could offer. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that on, on sequences. That that that's really the approach to go for to really hone it into into the one that you want to focus on, um, and to yeah to 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 think of the people at the other end that are reading it. You know, if we when 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 we're looking at the sequences here, we want to be able to get into it really to see exactly what you're trying to do with it. So yeah, absolutely make it. I would also want to say in terms of the organisation of the poems that I submitted, so I put in 30 pages of poems which all weren't always one poem per page, um, that I tried to make sure rather than focusing necessarily on narrative order as they will exist in the final piece of work, I put forward what I felt, number one, the poem that was the strongest, because I knew that I wanted, you know, after reading however many submissions somebody might have read to get to mine, I wanted them to have the strongest poem that I, I could offer on the first page not for them to wait for it sort of in page to page 10. So I would think again, um, in terms of your organization of the order of the poems, place the best and strongest poem that you feel that you have on the first page, because that's the point that someone's going to read from. Absolutely, I think that's really good advice no matter where you're applying actually, um, to put your strongest work towards the front. Hannah, you're muted. I, I think so. I mean you want you you need to start as you wish to be as you want to go on um, and it may well be in there just makes up but they know what heights you can hit um, yeah yeah okay fantastic um yeah so just moving on to actually you know that's more to do with the content of what we're submitting to actually how you go about doing it. So how you make a professional approach to a publisher or a magazine or, or, or whatever, um, you know, to write a development program, anything like that. So we've, we've actually talked a little bit about some of these points already. I was just wondering, um, maybe JT, maybe, um, what do you think poets should be doing before they, you know, approach someone like Hannah at a publisher with a with a collection should they should should what what should they have achieved um to make their work stand out 
Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's a hard question. I guess one of, one of the things I would say, in, kind of to supplement a lot of the different advice that we've been given, is it's really easy to think of of any kind of writing, maybe especially poetry, as like an individual pursuit, and it's something that everybody is just sitting in their house and in, in writing away, and then is going to submit their work, and then they're going to be published as an individual, and that is kind of you know the way it happens. There's one name on the cover of the book, but that one of the best things you can do, I think, before submitting is really getting involved in, 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 in different kinds of networks and getting this sense of, of, of making friends and, and having writers that you share your work with and you're reading each other's book manuscripts before you're submitting or you're, you're talking about poetry and you're excited about it and, and it feels like a social collaborative thing um, that, that you will know from that, from gauging from other people's reactions when, when, when the time is right to approach a publisher and who the right publisher is. And maybe, you know, I know the, the cynical way of looking at it is, you know, when people say, oh, it's all about who you know, um, the positive way is, is that, you know, that there are all these people out there and you can, and you can meet them and you can connect with them. And, 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 and a lot of books get published in that way. They get published because you have had conversations over years years maybe with 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 an editor or a publisher who says you know I'm really interested in, in your approach and your ideas and then when the time comes uh, so I guess I would just encourage that kind of outward looking approach that you don't just feel like I've got my sight set on this publisher and I'm going to you know seal the deal in that way but to to think of it more holistically um, to really explore the options I guess and to yeah yeah to, to look at what's out there yeah you know, and also that a fairly that common, uh, not a, perhaps not a common way, but a, a good way, and ones that Jeremy will always take seriously. Uh, one disclaimer, I'm not the person that gets to decide on poetry and what's published, and that's Jeremy Pointing and Kwame Dawes, the editors. Um, but if a poet that they like and respect, whether or not we publish them, but a poet says, look at this young poet, then we definitely look. Um, so yeah, it's, it's that mixing with um, and and really becoming part of yeah of, of a reading world and and being confident in yourself and what you're trying to do um, yeah yeah and, and JT sort of touched on something there about you know knowing that when the time is right to submit to submit something to take it that to that point um, Joe do you want to sort of expand on that how you know how you know it's the right moment. To, to submit anything really, to submit a single poem or to submit a, you know, longer a longer piece of work. I mean, a poem's probably finished when it stopped screaming at you, right? Like that's when you need to start thinking about sending it out and and letting it go. Um, but also, I think a, the biggest part of being a poet is rejection. That you're going to be rejected often, very often, and you just need to learn to kind of deal with that and build up a, a resilience to that and I can speak to this from sort of the perspective of, as, of an independent publisher with Butcher's Dog you know that we receive over 1,500 submissions in every call and poets send us three poems of up to 40 lines each um, we read that work and we have to turn down like 95% of the work and we, we turn away amazing work that we would very happily publish, but unfortunately we don't have the space to publish it. So I think accepting that, you know, presses don't have an unlimited kind of resource to support your work. It's not a right that your, that your work will be published. It's, it's a real privilege that your work gets selected and does go forward. And often that's simply because of what we've been discussing here about poems that speak to each other and kind of sing to each other, that they work well together. Um, how to make this more useful for people in the audience, things that people commonly mess up, they don't read the guidelines. Um, I can understand if a publisher is a little wishy-washy on detail, but most publishers have really extensive guidelines precisely because we get questions on a very regular basis um, or we get work that just completely ignores what we've what we've advised. So I think this comes down to to respect. You know, we really respect your work, and we want you to respect our time, um, especially when the publishing house is reading your work for free. Uh, so make sure you know your fonts right. Don't add silly pictures. Make sure you're eligible to send the work in the first place. 
uh, butchers dog only accepts writers from the UK and Republic of Ireland at the moment and we do receive a steady amount that are from outside of these areas and we just don't have the woman power to to make that happen to you know to to publish internationally we just can't process that many um submissions so yeah read the publisher's guidelines read the work aloud before you send it um and read work by the publisher this came up in something that jt was saying um if you are wanting to be in a particular magazine are you wanting to be in that magazine because you admire the work that's featured in there and the poets that are featured in there. Butcher's Dog really strives to publish diverse poems by writers from a huge array of backgrounds. Um, you know, do you want to be in Butcher's Dog because you are one of those writers and you feel like your work has, you know, your craft has earned a place there? Or do you want to be in that magazine because people think that it's good? So think about the difference between the kind of superficial this is a big magazine and a really, you know, a deeply understood and deeply felt uh, connection with the magazine that you've bought it, that you've read it, that you've had it in your hands, you've felt the quality of the magazine. Um, yeah, I think if, if you are looking for publication and you're thinking about who's going to publish your work, then it's there's a bit of a, a respectful sort of synergy between poets and and publishers in that, the more work that you um, send, the better our publications will be. The more of our publications that you buy, the more publications that we can produce. So it's, it's a really healthy ecosystem. Make sure that you're reading. You know, if you want to be a poet and you want to publish, you should be reading too, because otherwise, why do you want to be a poet? Why do you want to publish? Yeah, um, that's yeah. really, really um, good advice, actually. And, it, you know, the reality is that, that it's, it's very hard, isn't it, to, to to get your work out there but, but there are opportunities there are outlets and potential places to go to and you, you can streamline it a bit if you if you if you follow some of this advice that, that joe and jt and hannah and rama have been offering um i did want to quickly whiz through some of the, the questions in the chat because i just noticed there's quite a build-up of them um so the first one that i'm looking back at was about submitting 30 pages i think Romy's touched on this a bit actually whether you can submit fewer than 30 that you absolutely can just just give a representative representative um sample of your of your poetry but it, that's just really to have a maximum limit on it um we've talked i think uh about lydia's question about sequences uh another question about the pandemic and yeah so if you were thinking of using your money to um finance a writing retreat and that might not be possible because of the pandemic yes there are definitely other opportunity opportunities other possibilities that we could look at with you um yeah any tips on how to maintain a writing practice if you don't have the luxury of time and space during the pandemic so this is a problem that i think is is faced by writers absolutely everywhere at the moment that, that there are so many things happening so many challenges um, and they're complex and really hard to deal with. But any anything that anyone would like to offer? Yeah. Do what you can. So, you know, I've seen things sort of online where people have decided that they're going to write for an hour a day if they can. And they sort of invite other people into a space to also do that at the same time. Um, uh, I'm part of various things and I get sent things where people say yeah we'll be zooming in on at this hour on this day if you want to join us and nobody says anything to each other they just get on with the work so again can you can you make that half an hour 20 minutes or 15 minutes whatever works for you you know if if it's if it's uh grabbed snatched moments can you you know all all the basic things about your notebook sort of having it on you T jotting things down as they arrive. I mean, invariably, lines don't just arrive when we sit in front of a laptop or are sat in front of our notebook. They arrive at other times and often inconvenient times. So when you're doing other things, it might be that a line comes to you. So can you grab that down or record it on your phone or whatever it is that's your process, but work with what's manageable within the busyness or the pressure. So if it's 15, 20 minutes a day, then that's what it is. But if something can become a routine and even then if it's not onerous to you try, try and make that um you know things become habit forming you know so to try and make it a pleasure thing you know 
in your cup of tea and sort of 15, 20 minutes to write if, if other things are pressured. That, that seems like good advice, you know, in that, that you, you're not putting too much pressure on yourself when so much else is going on around you. Yeah, so, yeah. I was just going to say, like, it seems related to some of the questions, other questions that people are having about themes and the emergence. And if it feels like your process is very fragmented, I don't think, I think you need to trust that those continuities and those bigger themes will emerge. You know, I think, any, you know, any book is just written one word at a time. And I think those little, finding those little snatches of time, then when you do have a moment to look back at the things, you'll find those, those connections there and you don't, you know, novelists work the same way, you know, it's, it's yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jetty. I think that's answered one of the questions we actually had in the chat about about themes as well. There, thank you for that. So, a question here about um, yeah, we use the word project to describe um, what could be a collection or a novel or a novella. Or, or um, I, I agree, it's not an ideal word, and it always makes me think of my geology GCSE. Um, but it, it's not. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and think of another word that we could use instead of that. Um, so yeah, themes, I think we just answered. Um, okay, there, are, there is some advice about, about synopsis writing on our website, but it's not so specifically about um, synopsis for poetry. I don't know if it's exactly a synopsis. We sort of say a commentary here. Has anyone got experience of, of, of writing like a commentary or a synopsis on, the, on a poetry collection that they could share? Um, Romy, perhaps? I haven't got it to hand, I'm sorry. But I mean, what I would say is, and I said this at the Rocho um, advice session last year, was um, I took some advice from some people that I know who I'm fortunate to have in my life who are mentors who are um, experts at writing funding bids. And one of the things that they taught me was the power of the bullet point. And I mentioned it on the Roadshow last year, was that I learned about what I call the power, or what they call the power of the bullet point, which is about summarizing things into key bullet points. It's also very good for the eye because the eye can skim over lots of information, but it also forces you you to have to be precise and concise about what it is that you mean so um, that's what I used a, a lot of my submission you know there might have been a couple of lines to start a section but then I'd go into bullet points which would summarize what it was that I was wanting to get across great thank you um, that's really good advice thanks Romy there, there were a couple of um, other questions that that were quite specific actually that I did want to ask. So we had one person who, uh, who's, I'm not sure who this came from, but who said, as a dyslexic person, I struggle with writing poetry as I can't process formal rhyme schemes and how can I get my ideas across? And I just wanted to kind of raise that one because you, you don't need to use formal rhyme screen, schemes, right? No, not at all. And also there are some, quite a lot actually, of really inspiring uh, writers who who have dyslexia and use it to their advantage in the text. I'd recommend looking at the work of someone like Lisa Matthews from the Northeast, yeah. um, who actually integrates uh, specific SPLD technologies into a work. So the things that are there to support her in um, in writing then become part of the practice. So there's you know there's there's ways around things like that. And I think sometimes we always, we, we think about the disadvantage before we think about that's the thing that makes me unique. That's the thing that makes me different. Um, and that's kind of your USP as a writer. So, you know, if you are dyslexic, use it and, and make that your thing, you know, make it work. It might, it might not necessarily be thematic. It might be the, the form that you're writing in will change. You know, maybe you'll work against rhyme. How would you, you know, how would you do that? Um, yeah. Absolutely. I think it comes back to what Hannah mentioned earlier, which is about voice, which is that's the most important thing, I think. Yeah. OK, and would uh, you know, really obviously really encourage that, that poet to keep writing and to keep submitting. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Send us some work to Butcher's Dog because our call is open at the moment. So if you have poems and they don't rhyme, we'd like to read them, too. So you've got until Valentine's Day to send us work. So do. Absolutely. Um, another question was, would anyone recommend self-publishing, for example, on a blog um, before submitting work to publishers? And I wondered if, uh, JT, do you have any advice on that, on the pros and the cons? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's a con, but the thing to watch out for is like that, 
um, publishing just literally means making things public. So anytime you've posted something and it's publicly available, it is then considered published. So you wouldn't, in most cases, most magazines, um, most people looking, you know, will say that they want things that are unpublished. So, you know, I would be careful about things in that sense. But I guess the flip side of that is everything that we've said about finding ways to share work and take advantage of these different platforms um, as well. And so I guess that there, there are, there is a time and a place, I think, for, for self-publishing. I've self-published lots, lots of things that I just think this is, I want control over what the form of the thing will be. Um, and that's, it's sort of, a, it's part of a bigger question about what you want to get out of poetry. And I guess I'll, you know, in that, uh, you know, that's, I can't answer that for every, you know, individually, I think you need to just work out exactly, but self-publishing is very, very different. It's not, it's not easier um, because it just means you have to do all the work yourself, all that stuff that all the, the publisher would do for you. So it's weighing up those, those different things. If I can jump in on that as well, there's a question from someone called Farah who asked um, if this is the right place to discuss the costs of publishing a pamphlet. That to me would sort of ring alarm bells because if it's costing you money to publish, then something really isn't right. Um, most magazines can't sort of, they can't pay poets for their work in terms of single poems, but they might give you complimentary contributor copies. Um, but bigger presses absolutely should be providing you with a contract, with an advance, you know, and, and you should be getting paid for your work. Um, so I would be, you know, cautious of that and look at the Society of Authors website because that's got all, of, all the information, all the, you know, the standard guidelines of what you should be getting paid um, in terms of the work that you're doing. Um, because work is, you know, writing is labour and I think people forget that quite easily. There was a really amazing um, tweet that I saw a couple of days ago where a parent asked a child um, what their dream job was and the child replied, I don't dream of labour, which I thought was wonderful. And I think a lot of people, when you ask them what their dream job would be, it would be to be a writer and they have this kind of idea of what writers go about doing all day, but it is work and it's hard work. So yeah, I'll, I'll just put that out there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think, so I think there's a distinction there, isn't there? There's the idea of maybe putting out poems on, you know, people put out poems on Instagram or whatever on Facebook, which is a way of kind of getting, like maybe getting a bit of a response to your work, getting some, you know, testing the waters a little bit. But then there's another, a completely different thing, which is self-publishing a, a, a pamphlet or a collection, which... Um, and remember, we have to remember that sort of publication at some level is a business. And so in terms of um, generating an audience, sometimes those digital platforms, for example, can be incredibly useful. And although it's an, sometimes an, uh, not a, a favorite conversation for people to have, and there's lots of snobberies that get revealed in this, but you know, when you look at poets such as Rupi Kaur, who's part of the Insta Poets, her following, her audience, whether you like her poetry or not, it's been generated by putting the work out there. And uh, it's short form and it's, there's an immediate quality to it. And she gets a reaction. And those people who react are the people who are then going on to buy her book when it's published. So if that works for you, fantastic. For somebody else, it might be performing, um, on, you know, using their mobile phone to perform work, putting it online, getting re a reaction from that again and generating a, um, an audience that way. So I, I'm just again wanting to widen that discussion of what publication means so that what's integral to it is performance and is platforms like social media that are essentially about audience and audience development and you generating an audience for your work and you raising your profile yeah well i think there's a whole conversation there isn't there which is kind of broadly around career management isn't it like thinking about all these different options are out there and how you use how you make the best use of things in different contexts and for, for different for different pieces of work that you might be placing somewhere and learning what works for you and what you absolutely don't want to ever touch um, and yeah, that, that, that we could, you know, we could talk for another two hours about that, but unfortunately we, we actually are running out of time. Um, and I know we were a couple of minutes late starting, um, but there were brilliant questions in the chat. Thank you. And I know we've got through quite a few of them, perhaps not 
absolutely all of the questions in the chat. You can email um, me at New Writing North if it's specific stuff about entering for the awards, um, and please do that. You can you can email either through the inquiries email on on the Northern Writers Awards website, or you can email through my web, my email address, which is on our Northern Writers Awards website, but is basically will at newwritingnorth.com. Um, if you have questions, specific questions about the awards. I want to thank all the panel for um, for being with us tonight and, and offering such advice and for being so kind and sharing so much and for sharing your time as well with us tonight. I wanted to sort of just close by asking each of you really quickly just to sort of highlight one thing that you might have coming up or something you think, you know, a poet we should read um, that you'd recommend, something like that. Uh, starting maybe with uh, with Hannah. Oh Lord, do I just have to pick one? It's yeah. horrible. <laughs> um, well, if I was picking a book that is recent that we've just published, then Nia Quay Park's The Gaze. That's an amazing book. Theme. That book does have an overarching theme, but it is so beautifully constructed if you're looking at order and the way collected together. And um, Nia's is quite a masterclass in that. Um, and a poet we published early in the lockdown um, who has, he's been making his media career, he's done it backwards. He published his book, Road Trip. This is um, by Marvin Thompson. Oh, yeah. um, and I think he probably started Twitter about like, you know, a few weeks before. Um, but, you know, Marvin is a massive reader of poetry and um, he is connections and readers and people online now so I mean there is no right way or wrong way to do anything yeah. okay. thank you Hannah um uh, JC um yeah I find that like impossible question. <laughs> I was just gonna recommend like things I've got my 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 uh, subscription to the poetry book society here and things like that lots of smaller presses are starting to do things like subscriptions or patreons or different things that you can keep yourself reading in that kind of way like you kind of because it's you know you, you buy books and they stack up and you forget them but to have these things coming in through your through your letterbox is 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 always a really nice treat especially at the moment so i would recommend those any kind of subscriptions anything you can do to, to give yourself a kind of advent calendar throughout the year of new poetry coming in it helps you to explore new stuff doesn't it and to yeah, absolutely. Yeah, choose things that you might not have uh, come across otherwise um thank you um Rami, um, I'm completing a PhD at the moment, so my life and world is wrapped up in that. So I have a list of things to catch up with post submission of my thesis. One of the things that's in my my pile of books that I have ready to to read is Inua Ellams's The Actual, which I'm really looking forward to read. I've loved Inua's work for a long time, and um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to to reading this. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and Joe, lastly. Yeah, um, I suppose I'll give a shout out to um, the Butcher's Dog call that's open at the moment because we're looking for new poems and we're going to have issue 15 coming out in spring. Um, but also alongside that, I've got a really exciting new imprint happening with Butcher's Dog called Wagtail, which is funded by the European Roma Institute for Arts and Culture called ERIAC. Um, I'm a Roman Gypsy writer myself and this is a huge uh, endeavour for me and I'm really excited to be putting together the first Roma women's poetry anthology and launching it through Butcher's Dog so that's one to watch I think for, for this year because we might eventually start doing pamphlets, we might move into more anthologies and you know good things are ahead. It's been a, it's been a strange year just gone but good things are afoot. Yeah, fantastic. I, I'd warmly recommend Butcher's Dog as well. And it looks like someone's just, just actually bought a copy, Joe, in the chat. Hey. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much to Helen. Um, so again, I just want to say thank you to all our audience. Um, I'm sorry we can't actually see you, um, but hopefully uh, events in the future will you know, have a slightly more kind of personal interaction with you. Um, but thank you for keeping the, the questions coming in. And thanks to JT and Joe, Hannah and Romy for for um, all your wisdom and advice tonight. Um, it's really good to see you all. And I think we're gonna finish pretty, you know, pretty suddenly about, about now.